He is the founder of BallIsLife.com. We welcome Matt Rodriguez onto Hoopsology. How's it going, Matt? I'm doing well. How about yourself? <laughs> doing really good. I'm really looking forward to this chat. Big fan of the site. Big fan of your YouTube channel. And I really wanted to delve in because I think with your website and channel, it's one of the most underrated facets of basketball, in my opinion. But before we hop into that, we like to ask our guests when they first fell in love or their first interaction with the game of basketball. So I'll ask you, um, what is your first memory and like your first kind of inkling of just you following the sport? First inkling of following the sport, I was in grade school, probably like first grade or something like that. And I heard this story about this guy who a couple of years before jumped from the free throw line and dunked it in a game or not in the game in the, in the NBA dunk contest. And his name obviously is Michael Jordan. So when I heard that, it kind of like blew my mind. And I was just like, what, like he jumped from the like 15 feet away and dunked it. Like that was just like not heard of for me as being a little kid. I was like out there trying to like measure how far it was away from the hoop and just really trying to take that in um, and understand like what that really meant. Um, but after that, I watched a few games of, of Michael Jordan. I became a huge fan and wanted to watch every single game I possibly could. <clears throat> and I watched some interviews with you, and you stated that you know the And One mixtape tour um, inspired you. I love watching that, watching that tour as well, along with the show on ESPN. Can you kind of tell us how that led into you forming the Stabalis Life website and the YouTube channel as well? Yeah, so Ant One was really cool growing up. I uh, started like really finding out about it probably when like volume three and four were released, which I, I was like a senior in high school at the time. Um, around 2002, 2003, I was downloading some of their videos on some uh, peer to peer websites, old, old school LimeWire and Kazaa and those types of places. Um, but yeah, I really like fell in love with just the whole entertainment aspect of the game and also, just the fact that you could find, you could see that it was more amateur created. It wasn't like one of those big cameras on your shoulder where it's all plugged in and you got a you got a guy behind you controlling the cable. No, it was somebody with their handy cam just going out there and filming things and then creating uh, this really cool video mixtape. I mean, the first one was Skip. It was a mixtape for its time, but it was kind of just highlights and then they just put music over it whereas like for us we kind of bumped it up a notch by really editing to the music um and that's what really like made us like really famous like in those like mid 2000s when we um first released our the derrick rose video that went wild on our website so yeah i mean it was definitely an inspiration um definitely something i followed a lot in my early 20s was uh the whole am one mixtape tour like pretty good friends now with professor and he's really doing well on his side and, and content creation, but him and I just go way back of just watching each other grow over time. Uh, him on the, the personal brand side and me on the media brand side. <clears throat> Matt, how did you guys expand? I My understanding is you guys started on, on the West coast. Uh, you're from California. If I, if I'm not mistaken, um, I grew up there for, for a period of time as well. How did you guys expand to become a, a nationwide website? Um, it was a long process. So initially I'm originally from Santa Rosa, California, which is about 40 minutes North of San Francisco up in Northern California. I'm from Sebastopol. Uh, yeah. Oh, no way. That's a really, really <laughs> yeah. uh, interesting that you're from there. That's right next door. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that's where I'm originally from. Um, moved down here to Southern California in 2006. Been here since. But as you know, being from Sebastopol, there's not like a ton of basketball talent up there. I mean, yeah, even if yeah. you think you're good, you're not that good compared to, to people like when you go to towards San Francisco or even coming down here to Southern California. It's just like a whole different level of basketball. Like, when I was in high school, our our center was like six, a little over six feet tall, just because he was over six feet tall. Like <laughs> that's just how it was um, there. But um, coming down here, a lot more talent. Started traveling around all over the country to go to these different events. Um, it was during the going to those events, you meet people and you network with people, and uh, 
you meet other people that are interested in doing the things that you like to do, which is, you know, going out there and being a part of the basketball culture. And in meeting people, you find out that like, hey, maybe we can network with this person and add them to the team. So whenever we go to different places and we find somebody that looks like they're, you know, good one to one with us. Um, and if somebody that we with, we would pick them up and add them on the team so we wouldn't have to travel as much. So little by little, we started adding different regional pieces, whether the Balls Life East team, the the South team, the Midwest team, and then us here on the on the West Coast. <clears throat> but that was probably, I'd say we really sewed that up probably like 2011, 2012. <clears throat> And to that point, um, you know, you guys, of course, do the the Fab 50 high schools um, and those rankings. I mean, what is the process of, I mean, even getting started considering all the high schools that there are in the nation? Um, and the second question to kind of add on to that is how how young are players getting noticed now in 2021 in terms of, you know, talent potential, when are they really starting to pop up on a radar for somewhere like the ball is life? Um, so first one, fab 50, that one, uh, so that one is led by Ronnie Flores, who's like our national grassroots, uh, editor. And he is, has been doing the Fab 50 for a number of years, actually. He actually did it with ESPN when he worked for them back in the day. Um, and that's kind of like his project. He has built also a network uh, with all these high schools and these events that date back probably into like early 2000s, even to like late 90s. He's been around the high school game for a really long time. Really has an appetite for that the high school game. He doesn't really want to do college. He doesn't really want to do pros, even though he very easily could. <clears throat> he just loves the basketball game or high school basketball game. So that's kind of where the Fat 50 comes from. Um, he evaluates teams all over the country every single year, gets coaches to send him uh, informational seats so that they ha he has all the roster information where the school is, who's coaching, uh, who's on the coaching squad. And then, uh, yeah, that's that's just a lot of communication with him and keeping up to date with all those teams. Um, it was obviously a lot easier to do prior to the pandemic because then you could go out to those events or watch some of the events on TV, um, whatever it may be. Whereas it, this year, there hasn't really been too much of a season. So it's kind of an awkward uh, Fab 50 compared to, to years past. But on the other side, as far as discovering kids, I mean, for us, we've always been able to discover them pretty early. So because we've been around the game for so long, we're we're going to events that some camps where we're there and there's grade school kids there. Um, we're not really going to pay attention to a second or third grader because that's pretty young. Um, but we will pay attention to like a sixth grader, seventh grader, especially if you're going into middle school, going into high school, um, just keeping up with them because there is the potential there for them to be a good player. But I mean, the hard thing about it too is Judging a player from high school to the, to college, a lot of people like to scout them for college. It's pretty hard to do. Scouting them from high school to the NBA is even harder to do, but there's a lot of projections out there. So now when you get into even younger, it's it can be even harder because some kids stop growing. Like some kids may stop growing this way or they may stop growing like this way. Like it doesn't any way it matters. Like are they going to be able to keep up with the quickness of the guys at the next level? And I think that's like the hardest part of being able to like properly scout these these kids uh, moving forward because some pan out, some don't. Um, and it's it is what it is. It's part of the game. <clears throat> Matt, uh, take us to when you first started shooting highlights. And I wanted to ask you this because I was an intern for, let's say, a local TV station here. We had to have media credentials. So how did you over overcome that? I'm sure there is. My guess would be maybe I'm making an assumption, but maybe when you're going to these games, maybe some judgment just because you're starting this new frontier. Um, what were some of the obstacles you in, you encountered just shooting the highlights when you're first getting started? And then also you, you mentioned in an interview that um, once your site becoming was starting to become popular, you saw other um, rival sites started to do the same thing. And nowadays you see everybody shooting highlights um, at, at these high school games. So kind of take us back to the beginning where you're just um, kind of the only one shooting highlights. So when we first go to the games, we we're actually paying for tickets to go into the game. Like we didn't really try to apply for media. We didn't know we could. Like you, 
when you're 20 years old, 21 years old, you don't really know like how this process even works. Can you be media? Like how? Um, this is also a time where like there was no YouTube. There's definitely no Instagram. There's no Snapchat. Like none of those things are really around at that time. Um, so just creating a, a website itself wasn't really sufficient um, to for me in my mind to be like, hey, I'm media, even though it probably could have been. Uh, so we we're paying to get in all these events. Eventually, as time went on um, and Balls Life got bigger and bigger, there were some people that were like super acceptive of it and some that were not. Um, in one instance, there was like <laughs> the administration of a school was literally like battling to not let us in the, the facility where there was a home game or an away game. Oh, wow. And we had like the school's team, like the coach and the players literally go to bat for us. And I didn't even I didn't even ask them to, but like they they were getting all this like love and shine and they wanted it to continue. Whereas the administration didn't understand it. Like I'm not gonna fault them. It was just they didn't understand it, to be honest. And they were just like, Oh, this guy's coming in trying to take advantage of you, trying to do this, this, and that. And I'm just like, I'm just here to film some highlights, man. Like I love the way this team plays. I love the star player. I love like like I met like all their families. Like I, I had a pretty close relationship with everybody and I had followed them literally every single game, like the prior year. So for them to go to bat was like really cool. But again, like some people were, are going to be super receptive and some are going to like not really know how to take it. So their initial reaction might be a negative one, but you can overcome that. <clears throat> and what has it been since your site is the model for kind of other copies cat sites and youtube channels and also in regards to i guess mm. high school prospects now gaining notoriety at an earlier age so you know i'm sure these these high school kids would just have to worry about being on like the local you know tv station or some radio coverage but now they're on the internet for millions to see so have you talked to a lot of these high school players maybe uh, years mm. later and it's reflecting on that in high school that's getting that media attention like you know way earlier in life has that maybe prepared them for more of a professional or college career where you know in years past you know that would be kind of a surprise when they were you know playing on the next level now nowadays you know they're getting that you know, heavy scrutiny you know just in in their high school career i think it's a little bit different for for us today than it was maybe like five to seven years ago. So five to seven years ago or even 10 years ago, like there wasn't a, a, a tremendous amount of social media. <clears throat> so with more competition means more posting things on social media accounts quicker. So when we first started out, it was like, no, send everybody to the website. We're going to film a whole season of games on a player and we're going to make a two to three minute mixtape on them at the end, whether it was from 10 games, 30 games, um, whatever it may be. That was kind of our goal at the time was to make that mixtape today because there's so much competition. It's like more of, hey, this game just happened. Post these highlights as soon as the game is over, if it's on a popular player. So then you're tagging the player. You're giving them almost like their own brand on these social media accounts where now you have high school kids like Mikey Williams and Bronny James having more followers on Instagram than NBA players or, you know, NBA legends. And it's totally like changed the game. So I think the latter part of your question on if it's affecting them from 10 years ago to five years ago to what's going on right now is hard to answer because I think right now the stuff that's going on over the past two to three years with the explosion a video across the board on every single platform. I think we'll know in like three to four years from now. Um, I personally, even though like we have this media company and we focus heavily on high school sports and youth sports as a whole, um, I would rather kids be able to be teenagers and kind of grow up a bit more. Um, unfortunately due to competition in the space, we have to find like a good middle ground on how to do that. Like I'm, I'm still not going to go and film something with the kid off the court or on the court. If he does something really bad, I, I've directed my team not to post anything like that. If he, if he does something wrong or she does something wrong, I think that's for her and her parents and the team to deal with, not for me to shed light. Like as if I'm a TMZ of the world, um, I did some really dumb things when I was like 15, 16, 17 years old 
And if I was really popular today, those things would be taken like the total, total wrong way. Um, as opposed to allowing me to be able to make a mistake as a teenager and grow from it. And I think that has to be taken into consideration more today than anything else. Um, because <clears throat> again, not every single person is going to go about things the same way that we are and not to say everything we're doing is, is the best way either. Matt, do you find that, you know, you mentioned earlier, like in the early days of your site, having those really close relationships with those players and their families, um, do you find that now with social media and everything being instantaneous, like you mentioned, um, does that actually create a little bit more of a divide or maybe give you less access in a way since they have their own social media accounts? I mean, do you, do you still find that you have... Uh, a fairly close relationship or a relationship at all with some of these, um, you know, top talent players that you're, you're highlighting along with the competition? Oh yeah. I think there's, there's still a level of uh, good networking there with each guy. I mean, regardless, even if you just communicate with somebody who's on uh, social media, like many of us who have been in this for a really long time, like I'm 35 years old, like I'm not, I'm not trying to get really like, close with a, a teenage uh, kid like they're we're on like sure. two different levels of of our lives so many times for us it's also more about utilizing some of the team members we have that are a little bit younger and can understand them a little bit better than I can at this time at this point um, but that doesn't mean that uh, I'm not still communicating with uh, the AAU directors coaches parents like stuff like that is definitely still happening um, but yeah I'm it's, it's it's totally different once once you grow older, but your the people that you're following never t- tend to get older. <clears throat> um, Matt, I wanted to ask you just in terms of the at- of social media and its different platforms. Um, now we see TikTok, you know, Instagram, um, Snapchat. Mm-hmm. Are you utilizing those platforms as well? Um, and has that changed the way you? approach shooting highlights in these new uh, media platforms that are, you know, I guess less in length. So basically, you know, the attention span is shorter because it's just because these um, new media video companies, um, the video that is uploaded um, is in shorter chunks. Is, has that been a challenge to, um, I guess, um, I guess facilitate yourself or um, accommodate your platform to those viewers that might have a shorter attention span compared to YouTube in which your videos are like, you know, can be seven to 10 minutes long or however long you want it. Like TikTok is, you know, it's a very shorter um, medium. So what are the challenges have you encountered there? Um, Personally, I tell it to everybody, I'm not going to try to to lie to you and say I know everything about every single platform because I don't. Um, TikTok is one that like I don't fully understand it. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, I, I don't hear. <laughs> yeah, with definitely, you. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely something for this like younger group. They really like it. Same thing with like Snap and those types of things. Um, I prefer more of like the longer form content than the shorter form content. But again, that's again where you use your team and utilize somebody that's on your team that understands that platform really well. And that's one thing that we've done really well is put people in a position that can give us the best chance of success on those platforms. It hasn't really changed the way we shoot content or or uh, uh, go and uh, create the content we have. It's more about presentation wise. So what's going to be most successful on each plat this platform is going to be different on this plat- platform over here. So we can't really have like an all, all encompassing approach. We have to have an individual approach with each platform. Um, and that's what ultimately gives us the most success is understanding that what, how each platform works. And then also just giving, giving my team the ability to go out there and try stuff and make mistakes and learn from them. Because if you, if you're not able to, you know, have a leash along long enough to let you make a mistake, and you can't have those learning experiences, then how are you supposed to really succeed on those platforms? So, I mean, that's something that I, I take in uh, just sports period, playing sports growing up, um, also just working in the regular working world before ball is life. I, I think it's just something that I want to make sure that every single team member here at ball is life has the ability to go and learn from a mistake and have the experience um, and, and deal with a little bit of adversity as, as, as things come up. 
Matt, um, you know, you mentioned yourself being, you know, in your early 20s when you started covering these um, and making these mixtapes, covering these recruits, things along those lines. Um, have you noticed any any changes as far as like um, like high schoolers habits nowadays? Uh, you know, I mean, in large part, I would imagine changes would be due to social media access, things like that. We mentioned like shorter clip, shorter attention span potentially is one thing that, that always gets brought up about younger generations. Although I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm about 35 as well. Um, and I, I certainly struggle with a short attention span at times. Uh, but have you noticed any changes from the high school demographic since starting your site in 2005 to present day? Um, so most of the stuff I'm looking at is like the data that I'm seeing on the platforms, but as far as being out there in front of people, um, I'm like, it's hard to, to, to answer that just because of what happened with the pandemic for one. I mean, I would still sure. go to events um, prior to the pandemic, uh, but just, I think getting that like human interaction with Ball's Life and, and the fans that are out there, not just the athletes, but the fans themselves um, that love the content you watch is like super important. <clears throat> and I just, for me, the only thing that's really changed is we keep having this new young audience come in that loves the stuff that we take and we have to learn from them as much as we can to create content that they like. So when I look at the information on the back end or my team looks at it, or we're looking at like, how are people interacting with this piece of content? Are they watching it all the way through? Or are they watching it a certain amount? Are they subscribing because they like this content? How much are they commenting on it? So I think there's all those different things that you can you can look at to kind of know, are you presenting this in the best way possible? And is it something that people really have an appetite for? Um, so I think, again, that goes, a, goes across every single platform. They're all different um, and they all have like kind of their pluses and minus to each one of them. But one series that we do have that we just started doing um, is our Crash the Court series. And that one is like gone through the roof on every platform we put it on, which is super good to see for, for us, especially because it's hard to create a new series uh, or even like introduce new people to your audience because Ball is Life has mainly been behind the camera, not in front of it. So now that we're working with some folks that are more in front of the camera and that people can identify with, um, as opposed to just the at focusing on the athletes, um, it's it's fun to, to just see the interaction they have with these guys. <clears throat> Take us when the pandemic first hit. Uh, you mentioned that a couple of times in this interview. Mm. Were, were you like freaking out <laughs> since basically there's no events at all happening? And basically mm. the, the pipeline for content was cut off just because there's no games happening around the country. Uh, can you kind of take us back to March of 2020? Uh, what was kind of the thoughts between yourself and your colleagues yeah. um, determining what other content you're going to put up for the foreseeable future? No, there was like literally zero freaking out on my end and my business partner's end. I mean, for me specifically, <clears throat> this isn't as crazy as it is to sound. It's not the craziest thing I've gone through in my life. So for me, again, like the, the reason why I preach going through adversity and learning from mistakes and as much as you possibly can is because it sets you up for a moment that's going to come down the line with how are you going to deal with it? Are you going to are you going to freak out and be like a deer in the headlights or are you just going to be like, nah, there's a car coming. I got to move out of the way. Um, so for us, it was like, all right, this is going to happen for a really long time. Um, it's going to happen for at least a year, potentially longer. Um, how can we set up a plan to make us most successful? So for us, it was like, okay, we have all this content going all the way back to 2006. It's 2020. That's a lot of content we have. How can we repurpose it? And how can we take advantage of certain moments that do come up um, to give us the most success? Uh, so a lot of repurposing content and taking advantage of those certain moments. So like one moment that we released on our, uh, we did like a, a recap of 2020. And there was a moment where <clears throat> Anthony Edwards had been interviewed by um, a lady on, I can't remember which, which platform it was or which, TV channel it was, but he was, she was asking him about, Oh, if you play this, how, how do you, how well do you think you'll do? And he was just like, anything you put me, anything that has a ball, if you put me in there, I'm going to, I'm going to do really well. 
And it was like a viral moment on Twitter. So for us, we noticed that right away. We released an interview we had with Anthony Edwards at our All-American game, pushed that up online right afterwards, like literally within like 12 hours. And then that video went viral. So for us, it's just, again, staying on top of things and constantly looking at what's going on in the space to, to give yourself and your content the best chance for success. And then in addition to on the, the media side, like there was plenty of times that that happened on the media side, but on the apparel and merch side, it was like, hey, we have apparel and merch, which is a very tangible item for people to, to buy. Yes, we're in like a really bad time, but that isn't that doesn't mean that, you know, everybody together is having the same bad problem that somebody else might be having having. So how do we how do we help those people that are having like the worst of this problem right now? So we we started actually I came in one day and I saw one of my coworkers wearing uh, a mask and it was like early on in the pandemic and I was like, "Hey, where'd you get that?" She's like, "Oh, I made it with some of the leftover fabric we had in the back." <clears throat> so I was like, "Oh, interesting. Like my wife is a pharmacist. Can you make like a couple for her so that she has when she goes into into work because at that, that time there was like no masks anywhere like they were just gone people just hoarded everything um so we we had her make one for my wife and then uh in the process of making it we had like all these leftover jerseys in the back that had like that moisture wicking material in it and we're just like hey why don't we just cut all these up and make masks out of them so we did that and then we decided to sell them and not only did we like decide to sell them, but we donated a good portion of the proceeds to the World Central Kitchen, which if you look them up, it's ran by uh, a chef, Jose Andres. And he basically goes around helping people in need around the world. But in this instance, what's happening here in, in the United States, he went to uh, like New York and the most hard hit cities and said, hey, let's form a plan where all these restaurants who are not getting any business right now. I'm going to pay you to make a meal. This is what the meal is going to be. I'm going to supply you with the supplies. All you got to do is make the meal. and We'll pay you X amount of dollars per meal. You're going to make these meals for people who are hungry and don't have any money. And you're also going to make them for our healthcare workers that are working in hospitals that don't have time to go and get lunch or, or make lunch or dinner or anything like that. So for us, I think between us and uh, two hype and Bucket Squad, we all kind of came together and we, we supported the bail project, which um, helps people with c cash bail, which cash bail is a huge problem in the, in the country as well. Um, and coming from where I grow up, I've seen a lot of problems with uh, cash bail. Um, so for me, it hit home even more that, yeah, I want to uh, this is this is something that I do want to support. Um, so I think between all three of us, we donated something like 70 or 80 thousand dollars to these causes during the pandemic. So like, if you really think about it, could we have all used that money during that time? Like, heck yeah, we could have, but why do, why would, why do I need to like pile cash up during the pandemic when I made decisions before the pandemic hit that put us in a good spot to be able to withstand something like this? Not that, not like I was preparing for a pandemic. Nobody was, but I always try to put us in a position where we have like 12 to 18 months down the line if, if anything does happen wrong business wise. So just being able to donate and help a good cause for us, it was just like a meaningful thing for us to do. And it all really just started because I, I walked in and one of my coworkers was, had made a mask from some leftover material we had in the back. So it's just moments like that, that, that I think going back to if I freaked out or not, like, no, it was like, let's go find solutions on how we can, you know, keep things going, keep the team employed and working and then also help some people out along the way. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah, that's great to to be able to redirect like that and and provide help to so many communities. Um I I'm just curious um since since we're talking about the pandemic and of course you have the ballislife.com is your website. Did you notice a cuz I mean, you know, I guess from a media standpoint, I mean, yes, the pandemic is a huge downside for everyone, no doubt. Um the the positive on a media standpoint, I guess would be like you have a bunch of people that are maybe potentially hungry for content. You know, we saw how 
how like the last dance um, documentary blew up. That's, that's when Justin and I started uh, doing this podcast. Um, did you notice any changes in terms of how your content was consumed? Any um, highs, lows, th- things like that? Um, on the website, we did see a little bit of a bump, but it's, it's nothing compared to what is like 2011, 2012 before social media really took over. Like people just have too much of a sense to go to social media now. And that's where everybody is, is posting articles. I mean, when I say articles, I mean like they're literally posting all the information on social media. So it's really tough to really compete in that space anymore. Um, because every, all the information is already on Twitter. It's already on Facebook. It's already on Instagram. Like it doesn't matter where you go. So mm-hmm. sending somebody back to a website is so hard to do, which is why you see people doing paywalls now, um, and having some sense of success with that. Some aren't having really success with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, for us, what we did is we changed our website into being more of a resource. Um, instead of trying to compete with the likes of everybody posting short pieces of content on their website, it's almost like posting a tweet on your website. That's how bad it's gotten with, uh, with posts on websites now. So we changed our website to be a resource, not just for the fat 50, but we inserted player profiles, which are a little bit different than what you're doing on the scouting website. So now you can go back into our database. It goes all the way into like the seventies. You can see like who played for what high school, um, what their accolades were. Were they a McDonald's All-American? Were they a Jordan Brand All-American? Were they a Ball's Life All-American? You can even, there's even historical data on those events themselves. So if you go to the website, you'll see like all the top scorers from the Ball's Life All-American game or McDonald's, who got the most rebounds, assists, whatever it may be, who won this this year. It'll change all the information for you on there. So um, yeah, we just we just wanted to become more of a resource and stop trying to compete with the, the short micro posts that were really going on online. I wanted to ask you, have you heard of um, NBA top shot at all? I have. And I just want to, since you're talking about shorter form content, this might be a weird question, but I feel like basketball is a sport that the fans of it are attracted to highlights, no matter what level it is, whether it's internationally, um, just you mentioned a professor anywhere. I think basketball highlights are pretty appealing compared to football highlights, baseball highlights. I don't think anybody cares about some random baseball game going on, um, but a, a diamond right by your neighborhood. So I guess where I'm getting at, just seeing like these you know, JPEGs and just these weird you know media content that you wouldn't think would be worth anything going for, you know, millions of dollars could you see a future in which there is some form of a nft for highlights on a non-professional level whether it is possibly high school or whether it is something like a professor where you could see hey he's playing in some park in miami and that's valuable to some to somebody out there a collectible of a professor highlight it, it, do you see that going in that direction or maybe even a high schooler is it could that be a possibly a danger in which you know big money could be applied to a you know a a basketball player you know male or female Uh, could that be something that's in in the future or is that an overreach you think um i guess we'll find out soon i mean it's hot today but is it going to be hot in like a year uh we don't know uh i'm still trying to understand everything about it because I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I used to collect cards too when I was young. And I used to like to you know, feel the touch, the smell of the card. Like, it's all those things. And when I see something that's digital, I'm just like, I know a lot of people are like, well, all those highlights are already online. You can already watch them. Like, oh, but this has like a serial code on it and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> whatever floats your boat today. But I mean, I do think there's an option for it if it doesn't get too flooded with a bunch of nonsense. Um, I think there's, I think moments in history are more important than somebody just doing a pass or just doing like a layup or whatever. And people are buying that type of stuff. I think, I think those things will get a little outdated pretty quickly. But if you said, Hey, I want to take the moment where MJ hit the shot over Byron Russell in in the champions in, in the finals, that's a moment that like somebody I think would want. And especially if you build a moment around that moment. So if you have, you know, MJ being a part of it, you have Top Shot being a part of it. Everybody's kind of involved with selling this like limited piece. I think that's more 
valuable than just mass producing all these different highlights that are going on. And yeah, you could say the same thing about cards. Like all it is, is really just a guy many times, just an action shot or him standing there. Um, but the card itself has different things on it, whether, whether it's texturized, whether there's different graphical elements on there, holograph, like whatever it may be, the card itself is really what changes everything. Um, so I think if, I think if we pay attention more to moments, it'll, has a chance of sticking around longer, but I could be wrong. I mean, I don't, I don't know. This is just like my personal opinion and my personal feeling. Cause when I saw the CEO of Twitter sell his first tweet for, I think he sold it for more than seven figures. No. That was more, <laughs> that was more eye opening to me than the, the stuff that uh, top shot is doing. <clears throat> Cause I'm like, Hey, that's a moment. Like somebody just purchased like a historical moment. And that's why it went for so much more as opposed to somebody just passing the ball, whatever it may be. <clears throat> Definitely. Along the lines of highlights, I, I wanted to get your thoughts, um, you know, maybe more along the lines of like the mid and, and late 2000s when you guys got started. What was kind of your your formula for making these mixtapes? What makes for like a great <laughs> highlight reel? Is, is there any type of formula that you had? I mean, obviously, you know, I think even people not familiar with the sport can recognize elite level athleticism and, and that's very appealing, but is there any sort of way you guys tried to structure the highlight reels as you built them? Yeah, it was the biggest formula was get like with anything that you do, you want to have like as much of it as possible. So for instance, like one of my favorite players to watch, uh, one of the first ones that I watched really was DeMar DeRozan over at Compton High. So his junior year, I maybe had like 10, 10 to 12 games. And then his senior year, I filmed every single game that he was a part of, except for like one that I wasn't allowed to attend. Um, but I ended up getting the footage from his dad. So we had every single game of his senior year. So if you go look at his senior year mixtape versus his junior year, it's like amazing. Um, but that's like, just think about if there's 30 games, each one is an hour long. Yes. That's 30 hours of, of game footage you have to go through. And you might only get like maybe 10 clips in there that might be usable. But in, in reality, it might only be like five clips that are that are usable. Hmm. Um, and that's with like a guy that has pretty good highlights. If you go to somebody else who has less highlights and you just get like a dunk here and there from them, you might only get like one or two highlights a game. Um, so for us, the formula was really following players that were going to give, give us something more during the games. Um, if we were going to find somebody else who gave us less during the games, then hopefully it was at like a showcase or a tournament where there's multiple games going on and multiple players that you're going to be filming. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really it's really about having as much as you can so that when you do create that final product, that you have more than enough to to make the best thing possible. <clears throat> Which players over the years um, have stood out to you in terms of their um, high school highlights where you're like, holy smokes, <laughs> this person's incredible. And then to that point. Which person have you seen from from this, that high school level that you thought was going to be such a huge star in college or in the pros that they just didn't pan out? Does anybody – or the opposite where um, maybe they didn't have the most impressive highlights, but all of a sudden they, they blew up um, on the collegiate or pro level. Does anybody come to mind over the years? Um, as far as guys that I personally watch coming up, their highlights – I'm a huge fan of Drew Holiday just because he plays both ways of the court. I've watched him press a team so badly that they only scored like 15 points in the first half. They couldn't even really get past half court. So it's it's di there's different ways of like, is that fun to watch? Like at some level, yeah. Like <laughs> they wouldn't let them get past half court. Um, and then there's guys like Akil Carr and Marcus Levette and Cesar Guerrero that are just magicians with the ball that – like sometimes it's hard to even can keep up with them on the court because you never know what they're going to do, but you need to be at every single one of their games. Um, so I think there's those guys too, that, you know, you, you weren't necessarily banking on them becoming, you know, NBA hall of famer or an NBA player, but you're just like, man, I got to keep watching this guy. This is fun to watch. Um, as far as players that made it in the NBA, uh, one to me that always sticks out is Donovan Mitchell. So Donovan Mitchell I don't even think he was a McDonald's All-American. Uh, he played in our game. 
Uh, he was a Ball's Life All-American. But when he was there, it wasn't necessarily just about his highlights, but it was just like who he was as a person. Like, he was giving you 110% in everything he did. He could like walk down the hall and he'll give you 110%. Like that's just who he is. So when he got to, to Louisville, it wasn't a shock to me that he was doing so well there. And then when he got to the NBA, it wasn't shocking that that he was doing – he does as well as he does in the NBA. And I think the recent statements, too, that Shaq had with him saying – I don't know the exact thing he said, but it was something like he's not ready to lead a team to the championship or whatever. I think some people like to take that in the negative way, but I think you could also take it in the positive way of he's pushing him. Like he wants him to do better. Like today, he might not, he might not believe it, but that doesn't mean tomorrow you can't prove him wrong. And it doesn't mean that his statement means you can never do it. It just means like, hey, he's trying to push you to become better and push that team to the next level. And can you do it or can you not? So I think he's somebody that I've just grown to like more and more each year, just who he is off the court as well. <clears throat> um, to that point, you mentioned Shaq and Matt and I have had these conversations in terms of kind of a generational gap between um, kind of the 90s players in which we grew up on and then the current generation now. Um mm-hmm. And I think the, the way Shaq talked to, you know, Donovan Mitchell is indicative of that. And also with Draymond Green recently saying like a lot of these players, yeah, I think he's, he referred to them as being pretty soft nowadays. How do you think these players in high school receive criticism? Um, do they take it from like you were saying, Matt, from a aspect of, hey, they're trying to make me better? Or is it more of like you need to, I don't know speak to them in a different way to make sure that they're not taking that criticism um, I guess heavily. Um, I guess. I guess what I'm asking is just the the sensitivity of players you come across. I just. I. I, I tend to um, come to the conclusion that a lot of the players now are a lot more sensitive, and that they're just going to not let, not let you talk to them any type of way. Um, they're going to voice <clears throat> their um, opinion if they they feel like they're being disrespected. So, as you've seen it from a kind of high school level, how do you think they're dealing with criticism from maybe um, older peers? Because nowadays. You know, it could be possible that these NBA players are seeing a lot of, you know, younger, um, a lot of highlights of these, you know, uh, prep athletes, you know, on Mm -hmm. YouTube, as opposed to, you know, they would have to wait until they're um, getting to the pros. So I guess, what are you feeling like in terms of this criticism that the younger athletes are are taken to? I think it's, there's just more light shed on it today than there was before. I mean, even for me growing up, whenever you have like that top dog at the school, that guy doesn't listen to anybody. He might not even pay attention as much in class. And the top guy in my school didn't really, I don't know what he does today. He's not a professional athlete. So I think that's just something that's always happened. It's just today it's blown up a bit more because we're so accessible as people on all these social platforms. And I also think that it's, it's something that has to be, almost like an educational piece by the people who are older than them to let them know like, Hey, it's okay to take criticism. Um, whether you think it's good or not, you can always learn from things. I mean, even for me, it's hard for me to even take criticism from people many times, but I do my best to try to receive it as much as I can. Like if somebody comes and tries to tell me something and they have no experience in what I do, I'm going to look at at them like, dude, you're crazy. Get out of here. But If it's somebody that's like my peer has a lot of experience in a similar business or a similar situation or experience that I'm going through, then yeah, I'm going to be like super receptive to it. But I think that's all like in here, like who you are as a person and what you're being taught by the folks around you. Um, Because one thing that I was also taught when I was young, we didn't have a whole lot, but whenever we were helping somebody, whether it was like move or helping them do something at their house, whether they had some work or whatever, I mean, I didn't always get paid as a kid. I might get some dinner here and there. or I might get a slice of pizza here and there. But I was just taught to like, hey, like do things because it's the right thing to do. And it's because you want to do it, not because you're looking for something to receive in return. So I think, again, it's really about whoever the person is. I I can't say definitively that kids are worse today than they were when I was young. Because, again, I ran into a lot of those issues, too, Um, whether it was people that were my classmates or who are super smart, even if you're not even talking about sports or if it's, or if you want to get into sports, it's, 
it's something that I think is, is always been kind of there, but it's about like, if, if you're being educated by the people above you to say, it's okay to accept that criticism. Well, Matt, thank you very much for joining the show. Um, Truly appreciate it. Please let our listeners and viewers know where they can find you on social media and then what ball is life is up to um, in the coming year. Yeah, for sure. You can find me on, I think on, Instagram, I'm Matt Ball is Life or Matt Ball is Life 05 on Twitter, I'm Matt Ball is Life. Um, and stuff that we're doing right now, we're about to drop for the first time a new women's capsule, um, which should be pretty cool here in like the next two to three weeks. And then we're about to drop uh, some new uh, merch on the just the on both sides here. And I think a week we'll be redropping our uh, online store as well for for merch. And then uh, trying to set up eventually a game where we have like a cool outdoor street ball game between like our East coast guys and our West coast guys. Cause the fans keep asking for it. So you got to give them, you got to give them what they want, but hopefully when we do it, everybody's like more vaccinated than they are today. <clears throat> That'd be cool to see. Well, Matt, we really enjoyed the chat. Uh, thank you for taking out of your time out of your Friday to chat with us. Really appreciate it. For sure. Thanks guys. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat>